Thank you for attending Ohio Sentencing Data Platform, findings from a series of focus groups on the development of a public portal, hosted by the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission, with support from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the webinar, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we wanna draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time. Please note, however, that there is only limited time available for Q&A. Third, closed captioning has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the transcription or to hide it, click live transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, the, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available online and via social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Todd? Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, Yana and Holly, and um, thank you for the support of the Drug Enforcement Policy Center. Um, I wanted to first ask if Sarah had any opening comments she wanted to make. Oh, thank you. And no, I appreciate being here. It's good to have all of you with us. And um, Todd, we look forward to hearing about your findings. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So, this series of focus groups um, that we held um, starting in July of this year and actually ran through um, the middle of December um, was made possible through a 2021 grant we applied through um, the Justice Assistance Grant. Um, it was also made possible by key support from our project partners. Um, as I mentioned, the Ohio State University Drug Enforcement and Policy Center as well as Case Western Reserve University Social Justice Institute, um, and the ones actually developing the platform, um, the University of Cincinnati School of Information Technology. Um, all of those university partners also helped provide logistical support um, for our in-person meetings. Um, so just to give you a brief roadmap of this presentation, I'm going to uh, present on the format of how these focus groups worked, um, move on to the findings, and then I, I will plan to leave 20 to 25 minutes left over at the end for a question and answer session. Um, so to start, we actually held five in-person focus groups, um, Columbus, Cleveland, Dayton, Cincinnati, and Lancaster. Um, we had a few others planned in other areas, including Akron and Lima. Um, unfortunately, we canceled those due to lack of attendance. Um, to make up for that, we hosted two virtual sessions as well in September. Uh, so we really, um, I believe, made the best effort to reach out to all corners of the state and get as many people involved as possible. Um, we sent out invitations to these events to a wide range of stakeholders, uh, and we got registration from more than 64 organizations. We asked that each organization only send one member from their organization, um, and we had 39 total participants um, and each of those were representing their own group. So the number may seem a little small, um, but those were all people representing much larger organizations, um, many of which represent all corners of the state. So the event structure, um, each event lasted an hour and a half. We spent the start of the event talking to people about what the Ohio Sensing Data Platform was, how we arrived there, um, and where we're going. We also allowed the opportunity for a question and answer session on anything related to the OSDP. Um, we then moved on to showing people examples of other states who were able to do what we are trying to do, um, other states and localities that have created their own interactive dashboards already, showing um, various criminal justice data with a focus on sentencing. Um, we then asked for feedback on those dashboards to get a sense of what do people like about that? What did they not like? How can this guide us in our own mission to do this for Ohio? Um, next, we moved into engagement questions on our own public portal. Um, we asked participants to explain you know, why, why they were here, why they found this project important, um, and also what was what was important for them to see in the dashboards and the data. 
So now moving on to the, the findings. Um, we got pretty uniform answers when we asked why people were here. Um, put simply, this sentencing data that we are trying to procure has a very high utility um, for all of the stakeholders involved. Uh, I've listed in bullet points many of the common answers. Most of them fell into one of these five buckets. Um, the biggest one being, for so long, people without any information whatsoever uh, have relied on anecdotes, stories, um, you know, things that aren't real solid evidence of what's happening. Um, so people were really interested in our project because of the potential to bring for the first time to Ohio actual real hard numbers of what is happening. Um, the second biggest bucket was research. Um, a lot of the stakeholders we engaged with are interested in research, policy analysis, that sort of thing. Some common answers we got back from that were people interested in studying disparity, fairness, and uniformity, um, research on outcomes. Um, if someone doesn't go to prison, for example, we know very little about what's happening. So just knowing for the first time, very basic question, uh, very basic answers to questions such as, you know, how many people are on probation, how many people are sentenced for certain offense. Um, and finally, a lot of people wanted the ability to study, you know, what, what works and what doesn't. And that kind of also leads into the second bullet point, um, informing public policy and understanding the impact of legislation. Um, so a lot of people in these focus groups uh, were really interested in studying, you know, not, not just what is happening in Ohio, but more the why question and how does public policy and legislation impact that. Um, some, some folks were interested in how do we use data to allocate funding, um, improve programs, more of a sort of programmatic level rather than a policy level. Um, and finally, we had a lot of people talk about um, what is a wide trend um, for all institutions is sort of a mistrust of what's going on and certainly a mistrust in the data. Um, so they saw, saw this project as an opportunity to um, kind of show people what's really going on and address, address some of those mistrust issues. Next, we moved on to showing people the, the dashboards and asking for some feedback on that. So one of the questions I asked in every focus group, um, you know, I wanted to know, did people find interactive dash visual dashboards useful? Were they just interested in the data or was it a mix of both? Um, the overwhelming response was that there was a desire for both. Um, we got a lot of comments saying that interactive dashboards are useful for answering quick high level questions, understanding trends, um, maybe seeing some things that are kind of difficult when you're just looking at a, you know, a spreadsheet. Um, we got some other answers saying it could be useful for engaging with the public um, and showing the public trends in an easily digestible manner, and also maybe showing some policymakers um, trends and you know being able to show policymakers at a high level what's going on. Um, we got a lot of feedback saying that for the member organizations that were interested in doing more deep dives, uh, research, and policy analysis they would like to see some form of downloadable data um, to really you know, use it in the way to answer the questions that they have come up with. Next, we moved on to asking questions about, you know, what is the best way to display this data? Um, certainly states and localities who have dashboards have approached it in a lot of different ways. Um, the, the focus group members got to see a lot of those different ways. So we wanted to get feedback on, you know, what are the parameters around how data should be displayed? One of the biggest responses we got back was, you know, some of the states we showed just gave a map of the state, gave some heat mapping, um, presented some numbers, but it didn't really answer what was going on. So a huge piece of feedback we got was that it's important to display the data with context. Um, as one participant noted, the scaffolding should be in place so that people understand what they're saying. Um, some people said that 
you know, the dashboards can be good at presenting what is happening, but it doesn't necessarily tell the story of why. Um, so that's an important bit of feedback for us moving forward is not just showing um, a visualization, but, you know, clearly listing what, is, what are the definitions of the data you're seeing. Um, moving on to the second bullet point, what are the limitations of the data? Uh, we all know that you know, it's not just limited to criminal justice, but in all types of research, there are limitations in the data. Um, so we need to clearly articulate what can and can't be shown, why something can't be shown, what data doesn't exist, what data is not in our model. Um, some other participants thought it was really important to show the legal context of the data. So not just showing sentencing outcomes, but articulating what does the law require in these instances? Um, you know, what is the sentencing range? Um, and, you know, it gets back to explaining not just what you're seeing, but why. How does the ORC code actually impact sentencing outcomes? Um, another interesting conversation we had was displaying convictions on multiple charges. Um, it, it's difficult to display in the aggregate cases uh, that have been convicted on multiple charges. So a lot of states um, will take the approach of displaying the most serious charge um, in their dashboards. So if you're going to take that approach, we got feedback that you need to be clear defining how, how you are um, defining the most serious offense. Um, so really, all that adds up to, you know, the general theme of you can't just present the data, you have to provide the context. Um, and we got some really interesting feedback saying that, you know, dashboards are really good, but this should be a starting point for looking at the data. Um, it's not the be all end all, it's not the conclusion. Um, when somebody sees the dashboard, it should lead them to ask more questions. And I think that's a really important point um, that, in, in our public portal, we are not trying to draw conclusions. Um, we're trying to show what's happening, why it's happening, um, and get people started in asking the right questions. Some more comments on displaying the data. Um, some participants actually suggested a model of using visualizations to answer key questions. Um, one example that was brought up was the Marshall Project um, has a project in Cuyahoga County where they actually solicit questions on what's happening at that court. Um, so they'll present the question, then they'll present a data visualization on that question. So question might be, um, what are the age buckets of people who've been convicted on a certain crime? So they'll take that question. Um, you can submit questions on their website. They'll show data visualization of that and then they'll write a paragraph description defining key terms in the data, explaining what you're seeing, um, and really kind of using it to tell a story rather than just simply illustrating a picture. Um, another comment we received would, was that it would be nice to tie in dashboards to an annual report on the data um, so that it's clear this data is being updated um, and it's not just a snapshot, uh, a one-time thing in other words. Um, so kind of tying in that visualization um, and producing report explaining what has happened in the past year. Next, we moved on to prompting people to tell us what was the most important sort of data elements they would like to see. Um, this could be things that are important in their professional lives, their personal lives, just anything they're curious about. Um, one of the main comments we got was about integrating data throughout the full spectrum of the criminal justice system. Um, so people really wanted to see how do cases move through the whole system, starting at arrest and through post-conviction, through re-entry, um, especially wanted to see what are the points of discretion, where are decisions made, why are decisions made. Um, I will say on this piece, it, it's certainly in our roadmap to begin integrating more data outside of the OSDP, um, but this is something that has been a major challenge for other states um, because you're talking about incorporating um, 
law enforcement data that's not necessarily uniform across all jurisdictions. Um, and then, you know, marrying that into pretrial data that's not necessarily uniform. Um, and you can kind of see the picture moving throughout. Uh, so our project is focused on getting the OSDP up and off the ground, um, which is primarily sentencing data. Certainly, we would love to begin integrating more. Uh, that is a long term goal. Some other comments were people would like to see the ability to see cross sections of data. Um, in some states, um, I can think of Kansas, uh, as well as the Federal Sentencing Commission, um, they have kind of unique and innovative ways that you can select and narrow down the data and display it visually. Um, for example, you can see how does offense type break down by race or gender um, or other axes, or you can see what, what types of offenses were sentenced to the longest terms. Um, so being able to filter, narrow down, and kind of play with the data that way. So you're not just looking at one picture, but you're looking at cross sections of data. Another comment we got to a similar um, degree was people want to see the ability to compare data across time. So that kind of goes back to what people wanted to see uh, as far as the annual report. So that's not just showing data for one year, but they want to see the big picture. Um, what does sentencing look like from you know, 2022 through 2026 so that we get more than just one year? Um, we all know that in data of all kinds, for example, um, 2020 was really skewed because of COVID. So I think it's really important to show how data is progressing across time so that we don't fall in the traps of just looking at one year where there might be some anomalies. Um, moving on to specific categories, uh, we got a lot of feedback of what people wanted. Um, we asked people in these focus groups to kind of imagine the sky's the limit. We could get any type of data. What would you like to see? Um, and we kind of, you know, <laughs> got you know, the big picture, the, the dream list of data. Um, I have, I've highlighted some, some of the most common elements brought up here. Uh, so people really were interested in pretrial data. Um, not a lot is known across the state about diversion programs um, or pretrial bond status. So people were really interested in, you know, how many people are in diversion programs? How does that impact outcomes like recidivism? Um, what is the status of pretrial bond among defendants? How does that status of whether, you know, someone is released uh, versus held pretrial, how does that impact their sentencing outcome? All very interesting research questions. Um, people also wanted to know sort of at the, you know, again, at the beginning of the picture, not just what people are convicted on, um, but how are charges brought, amended, and reduced? So kind of what is going on before someone is actually sentenced. Um, another big thing was the actual sentencing data. Um, so a lot of people want to do analysis on the Ohio Revised Code. You know, how, do, how does the legislature impact criminal justice, um, which I'm excited to say our offense code portal project is addressing just that. Um, so one of the biggest issues in aggregating court data is that not everybody is using the same language and describing offense code as it ties into the Ohio Revised Code. Um, so our offense code project, um, which we talk about on our website, it, it begins to make that uniform and standardized so that everyone's speaking the same language and you'll be able to actually do analysis on how do you know convictions, sentencing data, how can we actually map that onto what's written in the Ohio Revised Code? Um, contextual data, such as people also want to see contextual data, such as aggregate, aggravated and mitigating factors. Um, you know, why, why has the judge made the decision that he or she has made? Um, sentencing outcomes, obviously, sentence type, length, um, even people want to see, you know, what are the conditions of community control if somebody's been sentenced to community control. Um, and another big point, which I was really interested, are dismissals. Uh, we, we essentially have 
no data on those who aren't sentenced. Um, so adding when a case is dismissed, charges are brought, but there's no conviction. How many people actually receive these dismissals? Um, what are the implications of that? Um, finally, as I alluded to, people wanting to see the full spectrum of data. Um, a lot of the focus group participants were very interested in post-conviction data. Um, so what is the rate of record sealing? Um, how many applications for record sealing are accepted versus denied? Um, what is the prevalence of judicial release after conviction? Um, people wanted to see tie-ins to ODRC data and probation data. Um, so in other words, once a person has left the courtroom, what's happening after that? Um, and finally, transfers to specialized dockets. Um, so when someone's case has been transferred to a drug court or mental health court, what do those sentences look like? What's the length of stay in those types of programs? And again, kind of what are the outcomes of that? Um, another category people were interested in was defendant data. Um, so looking into the de demographics, race, um, gender, ethnicity. A lot of people mentioned um, income, which is very interesting, uh, but to my knowledge, uh, defendant income is not something that's currently being collected. Um, so the future implications of that are the demographics are constrained by what is actually collected. Um, people also want to see criminal history. That kind of gets back to the contextual piece um, of you know, explaining why sentence happened the way it did. Um, criminal history, as many attest, is a big part of the sentence. Um, it certainly has huge research implications. So I understand why people would want to see that. Tying into that are risk assessment scores. So there's a variety of risk assessment tools that are used in Ohio. Um, the biggest problem is that they aren't necessarily standardized um, and neither is criminal history. So that's a, a challenge to represent in the data, um, but it's certainly an important piece of sentencing. And finally, um, for research purposes, people mentioned wanting to tie this defendant data into population data, um, such as the census would be the biggest one. Um, so they can kind of compare how the de defendant demographics compared to the demographics of the state, for example. Okay, so those were really the main pieces. Um, I tried to summarize what sort of data elements people wanted to see in broad categories. Um, we have a larger report coming up as a result of this that goes into more detail about the data elements people want to see, um, but this is sort of the, the broad painting of that. Um, so next, I kind of wanted to talk about the next steps. Um, so we we did these seven focus groups. We got a lot of great input, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering where we go from here, uh, which is a great question. Uh, so I wanted to elaborate that on that a little bit. Um, so we're going to take the results of this report, what I've presented, um, and use it in conjunction with other stakeholder feedback. Um, with our focus groups, we try to target people more so um, who are not you know, directly working in the system um, because we really haven't had an opportunity to get their feedback. Um, so researchers, academics, um, people in other state agencies who are not necessarily participating in this um, and the general public as well. So we wanna sort of marry the feedback from those stakeholders with our other stakeholders you know, who might be using the system um, or who are otherwise involved in the criminal justice system, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, for example, um, clerk of courts, court administrators, um, kind of marry feedback from all those stakeholders and use it and develop, use it to develop, further develop the public portal um, with our partners in the UC, UC School of Information Technology. Um, so we're kind of collecting all the information uh, and using that in development of mock dashboards. Um, so the reason that they're mock dashboards is to be perfectly candid. 
we do not have any sort of data um, whatsoever. Um, we're kind of in the process of refining the actual um, sentencing entry in the Ohio Sentencing Data Platform. Um, and courts are in what is called a pilot program. Um, and you can go to our website, ohiosentencingdata.info, to see so, um, what counties are participating and what stage they're participating at. Um, but currently, all of these courts are sort of in the experimental piloting phase. So they're giving feedback towards the development of the OSDP. Um, they're fitting it and working on fitting it into their courts. Um, so there's no data whatsoever that's being collected at this point. Um, but it's very important to us to use the feedback from these focus groups to develop what we call mock dashboards. Um, so using completely made up data, we want to create a series of you know, four to five different dashboards of what we think people would be interested in seeing um, and then soliciting further feedback on that. Um, a big thing that the University of Cincinnati wants to do is sort of make Ohio a leader um, with the public portal and the data dashboards. Um, so I know they're very interested in exploring unique and innovative ways to display data. Um, you know, taking what other states have done and sort of building upon that and enhancing that um, in a way that, you know, really explores, like I said, not the what of sentencing, but the why. Um, so I look forward to see uh, what the University of Cincinnati does with this feedback and sort of advancing these unique and innovative models. Um, I'm excited to see what we are able to develop together. And finally, I think that, you know, the biggest thing that came out of these focus groups was currently we're in an environment where there's very little knowledge of what's happening in sentencing. And we're relying on, you know, as I said, anecdotes um, and, you know, media clippings that don't necessarily show the bigger picture. So I think that really you know, highlights the importance of what we're doing with the OSDP, OSDP, how important it is. Um, and the biggest next step is continuing to advocate for its use um, and for its importance. So with that, um, I'd like to take any questions from the audience. So there's one question uh, from Bay Alexander. She said, I felt as if the OSDP um, neglected pretrial data by not having more pretrial related information displayed. We know pretrial circumstances strongly influence sentencing outcomes. So what pretrial data can we expect, expect the platform to start integrating? Um, and then that's the first question. Um, so yes, I, I certainly agree. Um, the pretrial circumstances are very important for sentencing outcomes. We know that through the research. Um, there is some limited pretrial data. Um, the problem is, well, I shouldn't say the problem. Um, right now, the Ohio Sensing Data Platform is really focused on harnessing the data that actually comes from a journal entry. Um, to start integrating some pretrial data, you have to look at you know, what systems are the courts actually using to store that? Is it a, you know, a local probation department? Is it the APA? Um, so, the problem and opportunity with that is similar to how courts are doing sentencing now. Not all pretrial data exists on a uniform platform um, in good condition. Um, so integrating that pretrial data would kind of require a similar process that we're doing with the OSDP in making sure that that data is actually in a usable format, it can be imported, and it's all uniform and standardized. Um, so I know trying to do those sort of integrations are in the roadmap. Um, it's, it's almost as if it's starting a, 
a whole nother process though. Um, so we're focusing on the development of the OSDP um, and that integration is sort of secondary. And I don't know, Sarah, if you have more. Well, you know, I would just say that um, I'm not sure that if it's where it is on the website, but the Ohio Sentencing Data Platform is a system of portals. And so when we say OSDP, that includes all of those portals. And right now, because we're in the beginning stages of the development, our primary focus has been on the entry generation portal for judges. And so that's where they create the sentencing entry and the templates for the uniform entries are housed. And in, at the same time though, we're interested in getting the feedback and working to like, you know, really manage expectations about once we develop this entry generation portal and um, entries are produced, how do we then translate that to information that is publicly consumable and helpful and it helps people understand what they're looking at. So it's almost two conversations at the same time, if that, if that helps at all. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the second question, um, also from Bay Alexander, was what info can judges and staff see that the general public cannot? Is the information privatized just for reasons such as security risks? Um, so currently, um, judges and staff have their own entry generation portal, as Sarah alluded to. Um, they are, you know, seeing what they would see filling out a journal entry and conducting their normal business on a case. Um, so, you know, yes, some of that is privileged, um, you know, internal documentation um, that in any case, only the judge and their staff would be able to see. Um, it, so, you know, what's actually the journal entry that's produced as a result, you know, sort of what happens in a case is public record. Um, what the judge and staff see, um, it's pretty similar, uh, but of course there are you know, privileged and private aspects to that. Right. Um, I think it goes back to thinking about it in the system of portals, that there's an entry generation portal. And then what you may be seeking is um, the public portal access, which we don't have developed yet because as Todd mentioned, we're not even close to having data to display publicly. So right now we're not at a point where the system is designed or um, even capable of allowing public access. We're just trying to do the homework that eventually when we get there, we have good information to help us build that. And I think that you get to that in your second question about the account and then the follow-up, will we continue to make seeking feedback a priority. And yes, absolutely. This is just one step in a very preliminary process. Yes, thank you. And mm -hmm. so far, those who are granted login credentials to the entry generation portal are the judges and court staff because they're the ones actually using it. Um, you can kind of see a preview of what they're looking at if you go onto our website the explore the OSDP page. Um, but members, because of the security issue you mentioned, members of the general public um, are not granted login credentials. That's only for actual court staff. Um, Lou Tobin asked, can we get a list of 39 participants? Um, yes, we have a list of the organizations that participated as part of the full report. Um, so that will be released. I get people a few minutes to, they want to submit any other questions. This is the three we've gotten so far. When do you think that folks can expect to see the report and will we release that publicly and distribute it? How we, I mean, we'll post it on our website, of course, but. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to incorporate, you know, some of the feedback we got here into the reports. Um, so 
this presentation is the result of um, the report I finalized this week. Um, so I would anticipate that the entire report will be released publicly in the next coming weeks. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll make sure that we send that out to everyone who registered and send it out to those we um, we invited in the first place. Um, so essentially distributing it to again as many people as we can. Um, Yana asks, could we talk about the approximate launch date? When will it be publicly available in regards to the database? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> we don't have a crystal ball, Yana, sorry. Uh, we are really in the beginning stages and bringing judges on board in, in that entry generation portal um, phase. And um, it w even if we, if today, information from that entry generation portal was magically transformed into public information and data, it'd still be years, at least probably two, before we have um, data that would be reliable and usable because you need the time to accumulate it. So I'm not sure when the kickoff date would be. We're hopeful to continue uh, building and developing the portals and working toward uh, judges, more judges signing on and using the entry generation portal as the way to complete and file journal entries because it's helpful to them, gives them everything they need to know to impose a lawful sentence as required by uh, case law and, and statutory framework. Um, and as we move forward, I'd say, you know, we hope to continue the, increasing the number of users over the end of this year. Next year, we'll have a robust and vibrant platform, and I think we'll get more users and then move into production. So it's kind of a long process. We have the roadmap on our website if you'd like to take a look. Um, and of course, as any good project um, does, we'll need continued support and um, appropriation from the General Assembly. So um, we're hopeful that this time next year, we'll be having a really different conversation and say, oh yeah, we know exactly when, but um, it's just too early to tell. Thank you, Tara. And we got another question from David Soul uh, from the focus group. I mentioned multiple feedback items. What was the most common one or two things mentioned as everyone wants to see on the dashboard? Um, I will say, one of the most popular things was that full integration, which I mentioned is very difficult to achieve. Um, certainly people wanna see the sentencing data married to other data sources, which is very understandable. Um, we certainly wanna see it ourselves. Um, the other thing that was mentioned um, the most, I would say, is looking at defendant demographics. Um, it's something that a lot of people are interested in knowing more about and studying, um, you know, what are, how does sentencing impact on various axes of, you know, who a defendant is. Um, so those are probably the two biggest things. Um, aside from, you know, we, we exist in an environment with no data whatsoever. Um, so I would probably, the number one thing is just having any data at all. And Todd, um, you know, I purposely didn't participate in the focus groups because I thought it would be a different dynamic to have somebody, you know, that is kind of the front person of the project. But were you surprised or were there any takeaways from, I think I heard you say a couple times you spent a good amount of the focus group time educating people about what the work is and was there some disconnect to what people the expectation that they thought information was already readily available versus developing it from the beginning? I, I think, you know, in the, I was there myself three or four years ago before we really dove into this. Um, there was a, a very big disconnect on understanding how difficult it is to make, to get this data uniformly. Um, and I think people were surprised 
that we had to develop a, a web-based application um, to really make this possible. Um, I think one person asked, if, if funding wasn't an issue, could you just go to every courtroom and collect the data that way, like send a staff member to go collect it that way? And, you know, my answer was, I, I think even if we had all the funding in the world, that would not be, um, it would not be a good approach uh, just because the data exists in so many different forms um, and it's so disparate and ununiform and unstandardized. Um, so one of the biggest education pieces was really just telling people, you know, Ohio is a home rule state with 88 counties doing 88 different things um, and really connecting those 88 counties is a monumental task. Um, it's certainly a task the states with um, really well-developed dashboards they didn't have to do what we did because a lot of them, you know, have uniform um, case management systems um, or more tied together courts that don't have home rule, um, you know, status. So they kind of had it in easy mode. But what Ohio's trying to do, um, it, it's a difficult task, and I think we're going about it in the best way possible. Um, so a lot of people really weren't aware how data exists currently um, and what it takes to you know kind of bring it together um, david also asks where do we go more where do we go to read more about this project um, I assume you're talking about the Ohio Sentencing Data Platform um, in general. Um, so I think the best way to learn that is the website I've mentioned, which I'm not sure the best way to give that to all of you out there. Thank you, Holly. Um, so OhioSentencingData.info um, really kind of gives the best picture of what the project is, how it came together. Um, certainly, I. I'll volunteer myself if you all should have my email through this event. Um, you can certainly ask us personally in the office, um, but the website's the best place to start. No further questions. Um, we, we still have a few minutes if anybody would like to ask any more questions. Um, as I said, it should be shortly in the next few weeks that this report is released. Um, in the meantime, please do visit our website to learn more about the project. Um, and I'd once again like to really thank um, OSU and our other university partners for their support on this project um, and thank uh, all of those who participate in the focus groups. Um, and I also wanted to state that, as Sarah mentioned, we're you know, doing our homework at the very, very early stages of this project. Um, so this is definitely not the last opportunity to give feedback. I think we'll be soliciting feedback all along the way. There's a question um, with respect to the background data on the defendant. Will data be aggregated, aggregated on indigent defendants and those who retain counsel? Um, I believe there is a means 
in the platform to um, select attorney type, be it retained, appointed, or public defender. Um, I'm not sure if we have indigent, indigent status on defendants. I think that's in there. Yes, uh, but I'll have to double check on that one. I have another question, um, if it's recorded, if a defendant is representing themselves, um, and that is also captured in the sentencing entry if, if they have declined counsel. Oh, all right. Well, so um, I guess we're over questions. Um, we haven't seen any come in for the last minute or two. So thanks everybody for participating. Uh, Todd, thank you for your work in compiling all of the information. And again, thanks to Ohio State uh, Drug Enforcement Policy Center for hosting us. If you have other questions, please let us know. Um, it's a, a group effort and we'd be happy to answer your questions and have you help us with the work. <laughs> so. Have a good weekend. Thank you.